So this evening, uh, observance, it's very, I'm pleased to be able to use the temple again. It's my favorite spot in the, on the whole planet, is this spot. So whether you agree or not, you're sitting in the best spot in the whole world. <coughs> so what you do with it is up to you. <laughs> we might spend our lives looking for the perfect spot to sit and meditate to become enlightened. And the thinking mind can always conceive of a better, something better or worse or that that's what thinking is. It's a function of the mind we develop and it's all about dualism opposites kama sukali kanu yoka atakina matanu yoka as we chanted in the tamajaka sutta the opposites the extremes the good bad right wrong heaven hell better good better best bad worse worse and that's why I keep emphasizing to, to transcend, to get beyond the thinking process. And this, is, this is the secret to uh, meditation. What meditation really is, is it's non-verbal, non-thinking. But it's not, I mean, and some of you probably believe that if you don't think, you won't exist anymore, or you'll be a zombie, or dead. But that's not the way it is. Uh, consciousness is uh, something we're all experiencing now. It's not, it's not divided. It's not mine, my consciousness and your consciousness. But the uh, sense of self is separate, so I have a sense of myself as being this body, this person, and you have your own sense of self as being identity with your body, with your uh, memories, personality. So that's where investigating Dhamma, we're going to the source, pure consciousness, recognizing it, because it's something that's here and now, it's not something you create or you lack, it's just you don't recognize it. And you can see the ignorance, the ignorance or avicca is is the force of habit, blind habit, conditioning of the mind with uh, grasping identities with the dualisms of the thought process. The conditioned realm is all about, you know, it's all divided into male and female, day and night, good and bad, right and wrong, big and little, fat and thin, <laughs> like this, it goes on into endless comparisons, one thing against another, heaven and then hell. And so this is the only way we can get outside this dualism is by being aware of it. We're not trying to, to deny it or destroy it, but recognize it. No longer be influenced, blinded, motivated by ignorance, attachment, desire, that doesn't mean we never have any desires anymore or the conditioned realm disappears into a void. But we see it in terms of jnana dasana, insight, uh, enlightened understanding of Dhamma rather than just operating from conditioned perspectives, from views and opinions from beliefs, from principles, from any condition, any convention. 
Now the, the thinking mind will, will, will assume that, that we're trying to get rid of conventions or, or deny them or destroy the conditioned realm. Or we can see conditioned realm as something, you know, as a Nietzsche dukkha nata, so it must be inferior or bad or lesser than the unconditioned. Because then we, we have the conditioned, then we have the unconditioned. If we have Nibbana, then there's the Sangsara. And that's because they're words. Nibbana is only a word. You know, it's not ultimate truth. It's a word. But it's, it's a word that, that, that is to be used for awakenness rather than for attachment. So it's learning how to use language, how to use the Dhamma language, not for forming the views and opinions about Buddhism and what's the true Dhamma and the false Dhamma. And we get into all the bigotry and divisions of, of the Buddhist world, just like any other religion. The religious fanatics, the, the orthodox, the modern, the ones that are right and the ones that are wrong, the great vehicle, lesser vehicle, and on and on like this. These are all words. They're dualisms. They, if you attach to one, then you have its opposite. If you believe Nibbana is better than Sangsara, you've missed the point. Because it's not about being better than anything. It's is being able to see clearly. We can say heaven is better than hell because heaven usually means that one extreme of happiness and pleasure and beauty and hell means its opposite. When we, when we use the word Nibbana, it's not about heaven and happiness and beauty and goodness. It's ultimate reality, it's the real. And then our relationship to the condition can be seen from that perspective, from reality rather than from blind attachment to positions we take on what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. Uh, the thinking process, just, this is why I keep emphasizing because if you can see, if you can actually recognize pure consciousness before the thinking process begins, and it's very simple, isn't it? It's a, a, a wa a wa an awakened attentiveness before you think. Or even while you're thinking. But you're in this, you're aware of thought as an object rather than operating from thought itself. So this is what sati sampachanya, these words, sati sampachanya mean. It's not being, trying to make oneself mindful. The idea that I've got to become more mindful is still, I've missed the point, haven't I? I've, I've got to practice mindfulness in order to become enlightened. That's the thinking process itself. But if I listen to myself thinking that, I have to be more aware, more mindful in order to become enlightened. That awareness of the thinking process, that you recognize, that's the refuge, that's the Dhamma, that's reality. And uh, the sense of I'm, I'm this person that needs to become more mindful, this is conditioned phenomena, isn't it? arising, ceasing. You're seeing it as an, as an object, they call it aramana in Pali mental objects. So in consciousness, you can, you're not conscious of consciousness, but you recognize consciousness. It's just this. So when I do this, then this recognition of consciousness, I'm not thinking. It's like listening. It's an open attentiveness. That's where I, the sound of silence becomes very apparent. Then, uh, then I can create myself in any way I so please. I can still think I'm Ajahn Sumato and 
I'm 73, 74 years old and I can still think like that, but it's no longer my reality, the position I take on life, uh, how I see the world through the perceptions of I am Ajahn, I am a 74 year old Ajahn Sumato. Because the refuge isn't in that, isn't in, in those words, those concepts, those memories, but in reality, the reality that is recognized. The real is recognizable. It's a fact, it's not, it's not a creation. It's not some precious high state of refined uh, concentration. So, and it's a apparent here and now, timeless, encouraging investigation leading onwards to be experienced individually by the wise. Santitiko, akaliko, ehi pasko, panayiko, bhajatang, ve ti dapo, renewi. We chant that every morning and evening, usually. So, and then we use the word dhamma, and these are words, you know, they're, but they're words to be used to, to remind ourselves rather than words that we attach to, concepts, viewpoints, opinions we form about Buddhism. Many of us, you know, we've, in the Buddhist world that we, you know, whether we're here in England or in Thailand or Sri Lanka or in India or wherever, we can form strong views about Buddhism. And people ask me, you know, what is a Buddhist? And, and then there's a hard line that say, well, you aren't a Buddhist till you take the five precepts. You have to keep the five precepts to become a Buddhist. And others say, well, the three refuges. And uh, then, is there, then there's the Bodhisattva path and the Arahanta path. Which is better? People ask me still, which should I take, the Arahanta path or the Bodhisattva path? And then there's the Tibetan forms, and then there's different forms of Tibetan Buddhism, and Chinese, Japanese, Korean, modern, old-fashioned, conventional, traditional, variations on all these themes. Now, the, ev the thing that's common about all these forms is that they are forms. They're sankharas. They're conditions. You can include Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, the whole lot, you know. Satanic worship, voodoo. <laughs> what do they have in common? They're, they're words. Now, when I use Buddhist words, when I use the word, say, just the, the word Buddha, now what I've developed with that word is that that very word is a reminder. It's a way to uh, be awake, pay attention. It's not forming a view about Buddha, uh, you know, and Buddhism and and uh, Buddhism is better than Christianity or anything like that, or the pure Buddhism, or the, you know, which is the best kind of Buddhism. You know, it's not that I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not interested in, in that anymore, in trying to be one up on everyone else or have mine being better than someone else's Buddhism. But the word Buddha then is the one who knows, the puto, puru. It's the knowing. It's pure conscious knowing from this, uh, you know, the awakened here and now. So I like the word Buddha because I'm not attaching to it. I'm not taking the word itself, attaching to the word Buddha and forming views and opinions about Buddhism, from defining the word and attaching to the concept, but the concept itself is a reminder. Bhutang Sarnangachami, the reminder. Here and now, awareness, awakened consciousness is this. 
ปุโทโธธรรมโมสังโฆ You see what I mean? It's no longer Theravada Buddhism or Mahayana or anything like that. It's using using this particular convention, Pali Pali Buddhism, but not for attachment or identity, but as a skillful means, expedient means, to use it for awakened awareness, for development of wisdom. Rather than becoming a Theravadan Buddhist, forming opinions uh, from from grasping the idea that I am a Theravadan Buddhist monk. So if I start from I am a Theravadan Buddhist monk, Thai forest tradition, then you know if I grasp that perception without awareness, just operating from grasping that position, then I become that. I become Ajahn s a m e d h u Theravadan Buddhist monk, Thai forest tradition, and all, all the things that go along with that perception, the logic or the associated perceptions that go along with that one. You see what I mean? It's not if I if I'm heedless, and I and I operate from a position, then I become like that, and then I see other. You know, even Theravadans who don't agree with me as, uh, as uh, you know, threats as wrong as they've got it wrong, or I can form views about Mahayana Buddhism from a Theravadan Buddhist perspective, views about Christianity or whatever. I'm quite capable of having views, opinions, prejudices, biases. Opinions, just like anyone else, <clears throat> but the difference lies in the awakened awareness of it, rather than taking a position. Even taking a position of wanting to be totally tolerant, all religions are equal, and that's that's still operating from attachment to a perception. Maybe it's a it's a very liberal, grand. Magnanimous perception, but it's still not enlightenment. So, just taking the word b u t o the mantra b u t o and listening to it. So I spent years listening to myself thinking b u t o I don't even have to you say it with my voice, you know, just think it. Just that mantra, b u t o And just observing, you know, I'm listening to myself thinking. And this way, you know, b u t o then comes and goes, doesn't it? The word itself in consciousness. I'm conscious before I think it, during, and when it when I'm not thinking. So consciousness is the background of it, of the thinking process. It's as simple as that. There's nothing mysterious or Esoteric about it, it's so obvious, plain as the nose on your face. They say. <laughs> Now, when you deliberately think b u t o in order to listen, you know, then. So there's a there's a space before I, you know, before I think b u t o I notice you know, there's this noting, this this empty, sense. There's no thought. There's no. Word, no thought in consciousness. It's just like this. I notice the sound of silence. So it's like the kind of resonating background consciousness. And then deliberately thinking put to. And then after I've said it, after to, there's nothing there but consciousness. It's recognizing consciousness. Is the background to your thinking process before you become anything at all? Consciousness has no quality other than con- its, its knowing, its discerning ability. But it's not a thinking process. It's not discerning or the condition, the unconditioned, better than the conditioned, <clears throat> because then we get tangled up with the with the vocabulary again. Nibbana is better than samsara. 
That's rubbish, isn't it? Not about being better than. Nibbana is this, discerning Nibbana is like this. Then I can see how I can become, you know, I, if I attach to the sense of I am Ajahn Sumato, Theravada and Buddhist monk, then I get carried away with grasping that perception, that's samsara. I'm a person again. I'm somebody separate. I'm, you know, I'm 74 years old. I'm Theravada and Buddhist monk. I'm on and on like this. I can remember all kinds of things from my life. 74 years, lots happened to this old man in 74 years. Recently had a chance to go back to Sabah in Malaysia. Was there 44 years ago. A lot of memories come back. Now I remember when we were at Mount Kinabalu <laughs> back 1965, <laughs> that kind of thing. Fair enough, it's a memory uh, that arises, you know, to, to the conditions. I noticed when I was in uh, Seattle the last time, uh, when Janice Clark took, took me on a tour of uh, the places I used to live in. I noticed the first house I lived in, which wasn't there anymore, by the way, but I could recognize the spot that within the first six years of my life we lived in this house, which no longer exists. They built a bigger, better house than the one we had. And, uh, but I could recognize that because those were the four very formative years, first six years of your life, you're, very, you're learning, you're awakened to, to things, you know, from that uh, are quite ordinary, which maybe w you would never notice as an adult, but as a little child, baby, learning. Notice the cracks in the pavements and things like this. Some of those pavements are still there. I still remember the positioning of them. And, the, uh, you know, even though the place, when, when I lived there, this was in the 30s, 1930s. It was, it was a relatively unbuilt-up area. You know, there wasn't one house sitting next to another. Now it is. It's just, you know, suburbia, and uh, with rows of houses. But I could. It still brought up memory from when I was only five years old. That's how memory works, isn't it? It's like in Proust's uh, book, you know, the remembrance of things past. Just the taste of a piece of cake brings back all these memories. I mean, that's how it is, isn't it? How the light, you know, sometimes you, you, the way the light shines in through the window will bring back memories from some faraway place, distant in time, place in time. You look into a crowd and see somebody and they'll remind you of somebody else. Just the way they maybe move or the shape of their nose or whatever. It, these, this is how the conditioned world operates. You know, when the conditions arise and this, 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 this is the result. When things come together then I feel like this. When when things are, when it's sunny and beautiful and, and all the positive conditions come together, then I feel happy. There's a sense of happiness. When things are, aren't going so well, when there's complaints and problems and crises and depressing news and storms and that, then the, the conditions that come together makes me feel like this. I don't feel happy anymore. I feel threatened or anxious. Now, the awareness of that is the constant factor, whether you're feeling particularly happy or miserable at this moment. The awareness is your refuge, not the condition. You can't find permanent happiness in this realm. This realm is conditioned and happiness is a condition dependent on 
other conditions. It has no independence. It has no consistency. You can't sustain happiness as an ongoing emotional experience because when the conditions arise for happiness, then, then one feels it. And when the, the conditions arise for misery, then it feels like this. It's a very simple teaching, isn't it? So obvious. But the knowing, the knowing is the same. Consciousness is the background for it all. So say the space here in the temple, it's been here before the temple was here. I used to live in, in this place over here. For nine years I lived in grotty little room at the end of one of the buildings. This is right in the temple here. The space, the same space, but the conditions have changed. But instead of grotty little room, we have a nice big temple now. So the grotty little room, I remember, I have a perception of it, but the space, it's the same. The things in the space are different. And so this is a way of investigating uh, the reality of, of consciousness. Now this universe is a conscious universe. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's alive, it's conscious, it's intelligent. But then we bind ourselves to ignorance and uh, the conditioned realm. You know, so even if we're highly educated, uh, you know, reasonable, rational type human beings, even that is, is, is still being bound and deluded by conditioned phenomena. We've not awakened. We're not aware. We don't know reality. We're operating from conditioning, from the sense of me, from what I think, what I feel, what I know about the world, what I've read, the perceptions, the cultural biases, the definitions, the opinions I've acquired through cultural conditioning, through education. That's why the world is such a mess. <laughs> Because everybody's operating from, you know, ignorance and their own particular world that they create, their own biased view, their own sense of separation and self and me and mine and right and wrong and good and bad and what should and shouldn't be. Now, is recognize, recognizing pure consciousness that's one. That's not a division. It's not mine. I don't create consciousness. I can create myself in consciousness, though. I can create a sense of myself, my unique personality, my, my position, my identity. I, can, I create that. But if I don't create a self, there's still consciousness. It's alive. It's not, I don't go into a kind of zombie state. I don't go unconscious and drop dead. It's very simple. It's, re it's reality. And it's recognizable. It's, it, you, you recognize, you don't find it as an object. You recognize it. It's so, it's like suddenly, this is it, right now, rather than, where is it? What's he talking about? And then you'll get into your, you know, views about consciousness. Is it a Nietzsche Dukkanata, or is it... <laughs> because, you know, you read the books, you get ideas and views about... People say you have to, you know, consciousness is, is a, a Nietzsche Dukkanata. So then you cling to the idea of consciousness because we think uh, vinyan, sankara, sanya, 
Vedana, Rupa is all anatta, anicca, and anatta. So then the logic is that the consciousness is impermanent as a, as a position we hold to. But the reality of this moment, the reality of awakened attention is conscious and is recognizable. So like in the third noble truth, this thing, this is the Niroda Satya, realizing, realizing the, the end of conditioned phenomena. Not the final end, all conditions cease and there's just an empty void, you know, forevermore. That's a, not, that's a concept. But in terms of this moment, the reality of now, you know, puto, this is real, you know, there's no, there's nothing left after to, but consciousness, this is conscious. And it's receiving whatever comes into it, you know, so somebody says, Ajahn Sumato, uh, you need, somebody, important message from Queen Elizabeth on the phone has to speak to you right away. And then I, I get up and go. <laughs> Gordon Brown wants to consult you about the plans for the future. <laughs> Barack Obama's on the phone. <laughs> Whatever, I can still operate. But it's, it's different than if I'm just operating from the sense of I am Ajahn Tomato all the time. So the, the reality of now is is, is, is this recognition. So the third noble truth is uh, rec realizing or recognizing this, this pure consciousness with non-grasping of any condition. It's like this. And then the, the, to, to realize this. And then the bhavana, the fourth noble truth is, is called bhavana or developing, cultivating this this pure conscious awareness. You recognize it, it's real, it's the path, you cultivate it in your daily life. So I say over the years of monastic life, this is what I've been doing, cultivating this. Or bhavana, developing, cultivating. Using the, the life <clears throat> that I have here or wherever I am. So I remember this. And some of you have known me for years. You've seen me, you know, the, the different crises and difficulties and personal things arise. Changes, disappointments, success failures, different emotional reactions. But behind all that, there's been a determination to cultivate this awareness, no matter what, what happens to me or to anything. So that's uh, like fourth noble truth, samaditi, samasangapo, right understanding, right attitude right intention. And it doesn't mean right as opposed to wrong. It's a, I mean, this is a limitation of language. Or you can translate as perfect understanding. In the 22 Indriyas, you know, you have Anya Danya Sami Dintri Yang, Anyintri Yang, Anya Dawintri Yang. It's these last three Indriya faculties, knowing this, cultivating this, this, this knowing of, and this, this refuge in reality, the real world, or the, what is ultimately real, is this. The world that everybody calls the real world is not ultimate reality, it's just conventional reality. And that's why I, 
emphasize this, this relationship of the unconditioned to the condition. Ati bhikkhuve ajatang aputang akatang asankadang. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Uh, this, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. And I got a letter when I got back from uh, Thailand from somebody in Shasta Abbey, a monk in Shasta Abbey in California. And uh, there they have, monks are both male and female. This, uh, this one's name is Serena, it sounds female. Anyway, she, <laughs> she was saying that she, she was turned on to Buddhism through listening to this particular quote. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, there is escape from the born, the created, the form, the conditioned. Well, what is that? How does that affect you? Does that do anything to you? Or <laughs> but as a reflection, you know, something, something uh, so sometimes it will suddenly resonate. Something in, uh, you know, in the Buddhist formula, something kind of reaches you in a way that isn't just intellectualizing or defining in terms. Now this particular teaching reached me years ago and I was a Samanera. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Therefore there is the escape from the born that created the form, the conditioned. There's a way out of this realm, a way out of samsara. We aren't just hopelessly trapped in this vortex of conditioned experience. Because I remember in, when I first, when I was 30, you know, I felt I was trapped. I was in a trap, like in a whirlpool. They're just going around and around, and I couldn't see any way out, out, out of this whirlpool, this vortex. Thirty years, what a disappointment. You know, when I was 20, I had great hopes for myself. When I was 20 years old, the world was mine, and I was going to really live, make it work for me. I wasn't going to end up like my mother and father paying off a mortgage the rest of their lives. I was going to make myself into something. By the time I was 30, what a disappointment. <laughs> it's like being caught in this whirlpool, just going around and around. It got faster and faster. And it was just, you know, meaningless. Life had no meaning, no purpose. You're just caught in a trap, like in a sticky web, like it's waiting for the spider to come and eat you, like a fly caught in a spider web. So then this statement, there is the, and then of course I was brought up as a Christian, so you have, i would given up on God and all that kind of thing, that dualistic way of thinking. But something really, you know, somehow reached me on a different level than the intellectual one than uh, when I came across Buddhism. Now this particular quote, there is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, unformed. Therefore there is an escape from the born, the created, the conditioned, the formed. Well that gave me great hope. There is a way out because there is this uncreated, unconditioned. Now following that, now that's the paradigm. Notice the relationship, the unconditioned to the condition. It's not destroying the condition. It's not annihilation. You're not trying to commit suicide or destroy your mind or make you into a zombie or anything like that. It's, it's, there is the unconditioned. And therefore it's awakening to that, to that, to reality, awakening, awaken to the unconditioned is uh, 
is the enlightenment of a human individual. Awaken the unconditioned is this reality. This is real. The condition comes and goes and changes according, accordingly. So in, in Vipassana practices, they often emphasize old conditions are impermanent. And so we endlessly contemplate impermanence of the condition. But to awaken to the unconditioned, this is, this is the whole aim of the Buddhist teaching. Awaken puto tammo sanko, we say. It. These aren't just ceremonial formulas that we recite. They're skillful, expedient means to, to remember, to awaken, to pay attention, to investigate. So these teachings then, Four Noble Truths, Paticca Samupada, there is the unborn, uncreated, all these are, can be used skillfully or they can just be memorized and chanted in like a parrot. Or you can take positions about what unconditioned means. Now what do you think the unconditioned is? Let's have a discussion around the unconditioned and, and the conditioned. Let's talk about the unconditioned and the unborn. Try to carry on any conversation about the unconditioned unborn, see how far you go. It becomes absurd, doesn't it? Because it's, it has, you can't imagine it. Is it nothing? Or is it true or false? Is there such a thing as the unborn, uncreated? Well, I don't, you know, where is it? Can you prove it? And, um, and the Buddha meant that, you know, all conditions are impermanent. Five khandas are, means everything's impermanent. I attach to the teaching that everything is impermanent. And so we take a position from the conditioned position. I believe that everything is impermanent. Buddha said so, it's in the scripture. Now that is still operating from the condition, isn't it? Taking Buddha's teaching in the Pali scripture and attaching to it. It's not investigating. It's not yoniso manasikara. It's not going deeper. It was just a taking a viewpoint. Uh, from a, from the scripture and grasping it. Now, in terms of awakened awareness, uh, Buddha's emphasis on sati panya, sati sampachanya. Now, this is conscious. And then, then the three uh, fetters, first three fetters, before you see the path. Sakya ditti thila bhatta bara masa witi kicha. Sakya ditti, you know, that is, I create myself as a person. My memories, I was born in Seattle, 1934 to the 27th of July, in Roman Catholic Hospital, to Helen and Clarence Jackman. It's even a birth certificate that states this. This is Sanya. It's not that I have to deny that, but I, it is what it is. You know, I can, I can uh, attach to it and, and never investigate. In fact, that I, I can prove I was born because I have a birth certificate. And strangely enough, the irony of my life is my feet because on this birth certificate is my footprint when I was born. And I'm known in Thailand as Bigfoot because I've got big feet and they're swollen. Now this is my unique sign. People keep wanting to cure my particular ailment. But I think you'd, you know, you wouldn't recognize me if my feet went back to normal. <laughs> I'd lose my unique self, wouldn't I? Bigfoot. So this is, uh, that's Sanya, 
Sanya Kanda, Sankara Kanda, these we create. This is cultural conditioning. You know, your class identity. You know, working class, middle class, whatever. These are conditions, identity to condition, to male and female, men and women, young and old, black and white, race, all of this is condition, phenomena. Pure consciousness it doesn't, is indifferent to it, you know, it doesn't matter one, you know, it's not preference anymore. But it, consciousness has room for everything. So whether it's good or bad, right or wrong, it still comes and goes in consciousness. True or false. So where are you going to have your refuge? What, what is the, you know, when you really contemplate this and investigate this, what can be the refuge? Can it be in, in being male or female or in being working class or middle class or upper class or being uh, Buddhist or Christian? Any of these as a refuge is go not going to be enlightening for you because those identities come and go and change according to other conditions. They're not sustainable. And they're always divisive. When they're always creating divisions. And when we, when we live in, in that division, then we always feel threatened and anxious, jealous or frightened or envious, whatever, we, you know, this emotional trap of being in, in, in the separate form, identity, isolated in some identity, some definition, is always going to create fear. It's frightening to be, you know, separate, isolated, because then there's always the enemies out there in some form or another. Just contemplate, what is anxiety? Why is anxiety one of the problems of modern life here in England? Why is there so much anxiety and stress in this society? Because, you know, even at its best, it's still device divided. Isn't it? There's always the enemy. There's always those out there, the immigrants, the, uh, the foreigners, the... Uh, the criminals, the drug addicts, the crazy people. There's always some, something out there to fear, isn't there? There's always something threatening me in my separateness, in my identities. So then the awakened attention to the way it is, there is the unborn, there is the un created, there is the unformed, unconditioned. There is consciousness. Now, after the end of Puto, that if I don't create anything into it, just recognize it, realize this is it, this is reality. And then, you know, you can actually create yourself in any way you want, just to see it come and go and change. I used to have fun just creating myself in all kinds of ridiculous scenarios and watching it arise and cease. You know, just to, to experiment, to, to, you know, really don't think you shouldn't create yourself or you shouldn't have an ego or if you're really mindful, you, you'll have no Sakya Ditti and uh, all that will, will completely disappear forever. It just means you know it. You know what it is. Where when you don't know this, then you become whatever you create. You're always limited by your own creation. So you're, you're stuck in that vortex of dualism, of change, birth and death. Because there's, there's birth, there's death. If, there's, if, if you create something, then it's going to die. 
it's going to end. If there's something born, it's going to die. But since there is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, unformed, what is that now? What can that be? What is the reality of now? And don't look for an answer with words. Just trust yourself to recognize this is reality. This is, this is, I'm not imagining this. This has no image, no form. It's not dependent on sitting here in this particular ideal spot, this Buddhist temple, Amaravati Buddhist temple. I can do it anywhere. Did it in Sabah, Thailand, <laughs> Portugal, <laughs> wherever. In London, even. In the underground in London, you, you still, you know, it's not, it doesn't disappear because of, of crowds of people and noise. If I get irritated, you know, I don't, I don't like the noise, it, uh, London's too noisy and polluted, and I grumble, grumble, whinge, whinge, and then I get carried away. And then I become somebody who w doesn't want the, the world to be like this. I, I can imagine a better place to be. Then I become that kind of a person, complaining person that wants something that I don't have. But if I take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, then Buddha doesn't matter where I where the physical body happens to be. It isn't, that isn't the issue, it's the awareness, that awakened attentiveness, here and now, Pachubhanatamma. So this uh, winter's retreat, this is an encouragement to, to, uh, to, to really use this time. This is a wonderful opportunity we have here at Amravati during the three months to just investigate this till you really see it. You have to keep working at it. You know, just keep penetrating no matter how you're feeling, whether you're sick or healthy or or happy or miserable or whatever. Don't, it doesn't matter how you're feeling. If you're willing to trust in awareness of the feeling, be the awareness, not the feeling. So under the conditions uh, that we have here, uh, try to, you know, have supportive conditions. But supportive conditions can also, if we get dependent on supportive conditions, we've lost it. So sometimes we learn best when the conditions aren't supportive. <laughs> I've learned some of them most important lessons when the conditions weren't supportive at all, when there's everything I didn't want was happening to me. And still, take this suddenly, there is the unborn. And at one point I remember feeling totally anguished and despairing, and yet I knew that that was a condition arising and ceasing. Sometimes I didn't want to believe. I wanted to indulge a bit sometimes. To feel sorry for yourself. Sometimes it's rather pleasant, fun to do. And the world hates me and nobody appreciates me. And <laughs> then, but if you train it, you recognize this, this awareness behind all, behind that despair and anger and rage is this. This is the refuge, not that. So that's where, you know, or in, uh, as I talk about using airports or whatever, London Underground, all of it is good for practice. And here some of you, you know, the people get upset with the lawnmower because it makes a noise. And we become precious. You know, we're, here at Amravati, we want, we want supportive conditions, we want it like this, we want peace and quiet. When we're practicing meditation, we don't want that bloody lawnmower going around, cutting the grass. And uh, we want to 
when I'm giving a retreat over here in the retreat center, no cutting grass while I'm giving a retreat because it'll disrupt people's practice and because I want supportive conditions for people. But is that, when I listen to that, that's, that's not a pleasant mental state to follow. In that I'd rather be aware of the annoyance of the, rather than trying to control the world to fit my ideal. Knowing, knowing what I know now, I'm not about to, to have uh, somebody mow the, the lawn every, all the time, but things happen. Airplanes fly over, things, you know, noises come and go and change. But our awareness is a refuge, not idyllic conditions, supportive conditions, tranquility and peace and, and a harmonious community. When the community is totally out of harmony, it's still good practice. Because we have to, because we don't want that. We want peace and harmony, tranquility. And then when we do have those conditions, then when, when the opposite happens, we get angry and upset and disillusioned. So this is, this is a, you know, this is a sign of attachment to the condition realm. When I don't, when the world isn't what I want it to be, then I'm very upset, despairing, angry. But whatever way the world goes, and it goes according to its karma, it's not up to me to control it, then my relationship to the world is knowing it, not controlling it. Knowing the world is the world. When I use this word, the world, it's a Pali word, loka. It's what we create out of ignorance. Each one of us lives in our own world, don't we? You know how, how I experience life as a person and that is different. It's not going to be exactly the same as you. So the world is a different world. My world against your world. But consciousness is one. This is where the world's no longer the issue. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to make you <coughs> conform to my world. But, but to awaken to the deathless, the reality, the unborn, uncreated. Because then the problems resolve themselves. We have, there is escape from the born, the create, the condition, the form. So I offer this for your reflection. <clears throat>